All right, it's time to talk about partial derivatives. <clears throat> this presentation is to accompany section 4.3 of the OpenStax textbook, Calculus Volume 3. So we're going to go up to third order partial derivatives, do first, second, and third order, and then try to interpret those geometrically. Do a quick review of the notation for derivatives. Using function notation for a function of a single variable, we would write y equals a function of x. Uh, the simpler and more common type of notation for derivatives is prime notation, where you would just put a little apostrophe next to the y or next to the f in that function notation. Well, the other notation you've probably seen is the Leibniz notation, where you would use a fraction bar and have dy over dx or df over dx. And of course, these were equivalent. We're now looking at functions of several variables. Specifically, we've been focusing on functions of two variables. And so we say that z is a function of x and y. So what does z prime mean? Well, z prime is rather ambiguous because it doesn't specify whether we're taking a derivative with respect to x or y. And so in that sense, it won't be enough information uh, by itself for derivative. Um, so if we want to take the derivative of f with respect to x, uh, we will use something similar to the Leibniz notation using the fraction bar, uh, but this is not a regular d from the English alphabet. Uh, this is a partial derivative operator. Uh, it does look kind of like a script d. And then this is read partial f partial x, or the partial derivative of f with respect to x. So you have something simpler and sort of analogous to prime notation, there is subscript notation, where you have the letter for the function, and then you the letter that you're taking the derivative with respect to is the subscript. So this is another way to represent the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And of course, we could take the partial derivative of f with respect to y, have partial f, partial y, or f with the subscript y. These are the two first order partial derivatives and the two ways to write them. Here's the definition of the partial derivatives. Looks a lot like the definition of a derivative uh, of a function of a single variable. Uh, using the limit of the slope of the secant line definition. You notice that for the derivative of f with respect to x, that the h is only added to x. And then the derivative of f with respect to y, using k here instead of h, uh, that, that number is only added to y. So when you actually take these partial derivatives, uh, there are two variables. One of them you want to treat as the variable, and the other you want to treat as a constant. Here's an example. g is a function of x and y is equal to sine of x squared y minus 2x plus 4. If we want to find the partial derivative of g with respect to x, we'll be taking the partial derivative, treating x as the variable and y as a constant. I would still use the chain rule, and so that would say to take the derivative of the outer function first. Derivative of sine is cosine. You evaluate cosine with the same input as you did the original function, and then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. Now, when we take the derivative of the inside, we are doing a partial derivative with respect to x. So when I go through and hit each of these terms, I'll take the partial derivative with respect to x and for something like 4, a constant, the derivative is still 0. For 2x, it's just like a normal derivative of x. But with something like x squared y, we want to treat y as if it were a constant. So the derivative of x squared y would be 2xy. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. And then y is multiplied as if it were a constant. Uh, same way, 5x squared would be 2x times 5 x squared y is 2x times y. Uh, the negative 2x gives us a negative 2, and then the 4 is gone because the derivative of 4 is 0. Let's try now to take the derivative of g with respect to y. 
Notice the beginning part's the same because the derivative of sine is still cosine and the input for that is the same. But when we take the derivative of the inside, we now are doing y derivatives. So thinking of y as the variable, this is a constant times y, which will just be the constant. And then both of these terms are actually constants. And so their derivatives will be zero. So the derivative of x squared y is just the x squared. Uh, you think of if it were five times y, the derivative would be five. So x squared is acting as a constant. Since there's no y here, those are constants and their derivative is zero. And so they don't appear in the final result. All right, take a minute to take the derivative of this function z uh, as a function of x and y. Uh, take the partial derivative of z with respect to x and see which of these answer choices matches up. Pause the video now if you need some more time. The correct answer should be b. Partial derivative of z with respect to x is 8x to the seventh times e to the 3y. You notice we're only taking the derivative of the x part. Uh, using the power rule, the derivative of x to the eighth is 8x to the seventh e to the 3y is a constant, so it's still multiplied with the final result. Now, geometrically, we can use what we know about derivatives uh, in functions of a single variable. They are still the limit as a secant line approaches a tangent line. Uh, specifically, they're the, the slope, yeah, uh, they're the slope of the tangent line, which you can think of as the limit of the secant line as the two points get closer and closer together. Uh, it's just now we have our function as sort of this big sheet floating in three space. And uh, you could sort of lay that line in a couple of different ways. In the same way, we could take limits in a bunch of different ways. Um, but the x derivative would mean that that line is parallel to the x-axis, uh, as is shown in this picture here. And if you did a partial derivative with respect to y, uh, then that line would be parallel to the y-axis. Uh, well, maybe it's better to say, uh, you know, this line is parallel to the z-x plane. Uh, and if you did a partial derivative with respect to y, that line would be parallel to the y-z plane. For higher derivatives, we can extend the notation. Let's do a quick review of notation for higher order derivatives for functions of a single variable. So we already reviewed the Leibniz and prime notation for first derivatives. For second derivatives for Leibniz notation, we put little exponents of two after the D on top, after the X on the bottom, and that two turns into a three. And for an nth derivative, that could just be the variable N. For prime notation, a second derivative will just have two apostrophes. A third derivative will have three apostrophes. And beyond that, we actually don't write out the apostrophes because it's just too many of them to count. So for fourth derivatives and higher, you would just write the number like an exponent. But to not confuse it with exponents, we put that number in parentheses. Now let's expand the notation for partial derivatives. Uh, we're just going to look at the sort of Leibniz version of the notation, the one with the fractions. We've already seen the two first order partial derivatives, uh, but now we have branching paths because each one of these we could take an x or a y derivative. So if we took a second x derivative, we would get a second order partial with two x derivatives. But we could take the partial f partial x and then do a partial y. Notice that when we do this in this notation, we do get the d squared up top. Uh, but then on the bottom, it's partial y partial x. And so the uh, different derivatives are being used. And this is known as a mixed partial. With the partial derivative of f with respect to y, we could do another y partial derivative and get the second partial y or the other mixed partial where we did y first and then x. And you might be curious about these two being the same. We will get to that a little bit later. Uh, going to third order partial derivatives, we could do three x derivatives. We could do two x's and then a y. 
uh, we could do x, then y, then x again, uh, or we could do x, then y, then y. Notice if you have two of the same partials in a row that you do group those the same way you would with the Leibniz notation. On the other side, uh, doing three y derivative, no, I don't start on that side. <laughs> on the other side, uh, we could do y and then x and then x again, two x's in a row at the end. Uh, or y, then x, then y. Uh, or we could do y, then y, then x. And finally, y, y, y for the third order y derivative. And of course, you can do higher order derivatives. Uh, that you typically won't encounter them higher than this in this class. Let's set up a similar graph for the subscript notation. Uh, the first order partials, we just have x and y. We take the second x derivative, we get two x subscripts. Notice we don't group them with any exponent. We do an x and then a y, then we get f x y. Uh, we could do f y y, and of course, f y x. So there's the second order partial derivatives. For third order, we can do three x derivatives, or two x's and a y, or x y x, x y y, yxx, yxy, yyx, and finally yyy. yyy indeed. There is a mistake in the book with these. Now the order that we're taking these does matter. And when you're reading the uh, Leibniz partial derivative notation, uh, the order goes right to left in the denominator. So we notice the second order mixed partial for f, uh, if it has partial y on the right and partial x on the left, that means you're doing the partial y first and then the partial x second. So the mixed partial is as operators, these partial derivatives approach on the left. And so from the bottom, you'd start on the right and then read going to the left. Looking at the other mixed partial, uh, partial of f with respect to y and x, uh, you would do the x partial first and then the y. So from the bottom, start on the right and then read to the left. What makes this a little confusing is that for the subscript notation, it goes in the opposite order. Of course, the subscripts are on the opposite side, um, but the mixed partials here, f, x, y, uh, you would do the x derivative first and then the y derivative second. And that's because as operators, these are sort of approaching from the right side. Uh, for f, y, x, that's the y derivative first and the x derivative second. So when you're reading these, read them left to right. All right, here's a third order mixed partial. See if you can convert from the subscript notation to the Leibniz notation. Pause the video if you need some time to think the correct answer is A. So again, with the subscripts, we're reading them left to right. So it would be a first a y partial, then an x, then a second x. If we look at answer choice A, this is the three partial derivatives, and we would start on the right and then move to left. So first is a y and then two x's. So answer choice A is correct. I mentioned the mixed partials being equal. Uh, well, a famous mathematician uh, by the name of Alexis Clairaut uh, did state a theorem that if the function is defined on an open disk that contains a point, and these two mixed partials are continuous on that disk, uh, then they will be equal. So what this means is that the mixed partials will be equal if these two functions are continuous. Um, if the functions aren't continuous, they could still be equal. They're just not guaranteed to. So that's another thing to keep in mind with the if-then nature of this theorem. And that's it. Uh, this presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, CC BY, and CSA OpenStax.